and I'm going to hopefully not break things because I'm one of those annoying people that keeps the guys on the back on their toes because I don't like standing still. So I'm going to present to you this afternoon something a little bit different from what we've had. If this doesn't work, someone throw, throw a hand in the air or throw something at me and then I'll go back over there. But we're going to talk about a project that is at the sort of start and one that I'm not going to be giving you results from and we're not going to be diving deep into data. Essentially we're asking the question, can learning analytics come before learning design? Spoiler, yes. And it works well. So if any of you have had to ever go through a traditional careers experience, you met that process that I know you can read process diagrams, may seem familiar. Linear process. There may be some personality or some aptitude testing going on. The human, the participant, may have some input in the information that goes in, but the careers advisor is the expert. They're moderating it. They're filtering it. Basically, they're reducing the conversation down to choose one from A, B, or C. Where's all the agency gone? And when you think about that sort of process, there is some data processing, some learning analytics that could go in there, but would it be reaching its potential? I would argue probably not. And then you get things like that. Pick a number, doesn't matter what it is, shove it in for N, and pick a date that's about 10 to 12 years in the future. There's your media headline. Is it helpful? If the jobs that haven't been, if the jobs our students are going to take on haven't been invented, how can we do the process before where we're filtering to make the decisions to give them a choice of things that don't exist? And when you start thinking like that, you start having to rethink. So that's what the Australian government did in something called the Australian Blueprint for Careers Development. Interestingly, abbreviation is ABCD. Everyone just calls it the blueprint. And what they did was they said, well, what is the point of careers education? What is its purpose? Or to use the classroom teach language, what's the learning outcome? <coughs> Knowledge, skills, attitudes to allow the students to make their own career choices. Give them the ability give them the practice, give them the agency, essentially. And so that's kind of what we've done. We've started with a blank slate. And then we said, let's play with our careers program, which is really good. I like playing. I'm lucky. My teaching is in university outreach. So that means when I get bored with one thing, playing with rockets, I get to go to a different program, a completely different area, careers development. And then I get to go play with submarines or Arduinos or do some teacher professional development. It's very good for someone with a little short attention span. But what we've done is we've said, let's design our program for year six, last year of primary school, to year 10, last year of compulsory education in Australia. 11 and 12 are theoretically optional, but 90% of people do it. Um, and let's redesign as an aspirational careers program. So the whole point is not to get people to think, what job am I going to do? The point is, what skills have I got? What might I use them for? Slightly different way of phrasing the same question. So therefore, we thought, well, we're STEM teachers by training, most of us. Let's do some inquiry-based learning. Let's de develop some challenges that require them to use these, shall we call them, I don't want to use the word 21st century skills because we're in the third decade, but um, transferable skills, communication skills, critical thinking skills. So that's what we did. We designed this thing up and then we said, let's take an example here, communication. 
what actually makes for effective communication? And we came up with three things that we could measure. And we said, if someone's a good communicator, the task will be likely to be task focused. Anyone ever worked in the service industry? If you're communicating with your customer in a focused way, they don't get grumpy quite so quickly. Is the communication clear? Both ways. Are you hearing what's being said and are you saying what they need to hear? Is the communication interpretable? Are you speaking the same language? So, I want you to introduce you to somebody. Got your attention? Guess year six's attention, so they want to go pat Monty on the head. The monster is called Monty. Although sometimes he does change his name because he does have a slight uh, split personality. Um, this is one of the challenges out of this pr careers program. The idea here is to communicate with a creature who doesn't speak English. Ash and Leah have um, been playing over the last eight sessions during the whole day experience where we've done some critical thinking, we've done some team working, we've done some creative thinking. They developed this chatbot. It's only got a limited vocabulary. They only met him three hours ago when he tried to, when, when they did, well, it's a bit of a spoiler, when he did make one of the crew disappear. For the Star Trek fans, yes, he was wearing a red jumpsuit, so it was perfectly valid. Um, so what happens is we've developed this little chatbot. It's not intelligent, deliberately so. It is not a general AI. Essentially, it's a giant version of a lookup table. We have developed, I think at last count, five or 600 different questions that could be asked of Monty and we developed answers that we would like Monty to give back. Yes, if the kids swear at Monty, he tells them off for using rude language. We have a naughty words list, so if you type in something that shouldn't be there, it gets filtered before it ends up on your screen, so your teacher doesn't shout at you, but you can still be a 12-year-old boy who wants to type the, the rude words at the monster. But our monster takes what you hear, we feed it through a very lightweight sentence transformer model, which means we don't have to worry about spelling. It's not one of those 1980s, I'm showing my age again, Phil, one of those 1980s models where you've got to type in exactly the right sentence to get the response. Close enough is good enough. It fits it through. It tries to match it, does simple cosine matching, pulls out the best three answers. Those scores actually come back through and help add to the metrics. It gives you the best one. If you're not accurate enough, it goes, Grr. what do you mean? Don't know what you're talking about, or something like that. If you insult him, his grumpiness level goes up. If you are kind to him, his grumpiness level goes down. The grumpiness sets the threshold of as to whether he's going to answer you or not. The challenge, find out what he wants. And the bit that the kids forget is once you find out what he wants, actually give it him. Otherwise, he's going to eat you. And what it actually does, it generates internal maps. Kids never see these. But this is essentially what's going on inside. We can see the choices and the questions and the categories that, that the student used on their way through. We can see their journey. They always end up at zero which is question not known. And they follow this loopy diagram around, and they always end up back at zero, and they go off in different directions and come back. 
But this actually tells us something about what is going on in terms of our students' communications abilities. Those three metrics I talked about before, we can get those straight from that graph. How many categories did you need to take before you got from the start to the victory condition? Think about the maths of that. More categories, lower focus. Communication predictability. It spits back answers of, I know what you're saying, I don't know what you're saying. It's a simple ratio. Obviously, the numbers themselves don't mean anything. But they do tell you something about the way people are communicating. What happens next is the feedback. We're not going to give the students a graph. We're not going to give them a, a triangle with a weighted centroid of where they are. We could. We might give that to their teachers, but we're not going to give it to the students because they won't understand it. All good student-led um, workshops like this have reflections. So depending on how the um, data comes out, will control which questions they get given. So you might ask them, how do you rate your communication abilities when talking to Monty? What made you say that it was a good communication because they typed good? Ah, did you stay on focus? Could you have been more focused? Questions to prompt their thinking rather than telling them what they're doing. The idea being that when we implement this as part of the bigger system, those of you who scan the QR code before get to play with Monty in his isolated form rather than his integrated form, they don't just get scores for communication. They get scores and hints and prods and prompts for critical thinking, for creative thinking. They get given ideas about where they might want to go next, what their next steps are. The teachers. They can have a picture of, the, of what's going on in their classroom, amongst their group. And uh, when you add all this together, and as I say, I've just given you one small slice, you might see the old careers-based problem in there. It's up there in the top right. But now we can have the, sometime later, we can get the students to reflect on their experiences. We can get them to ex reflect on the experiences of their teammates and their friends. We can use the learning analytics that we've collected along the way to prod them and prompt them and support that. That goes into your self-evaluation, your self-reflection. And our system, which was once and done, now becomes cyclical. And they're thinking, and they're growing, and they're developing. That's the theory. The important question, because it's a workshop for students, we always ask this one. Was it fun? Because that's important. And I know the color contrast is better on my screen than it is up there. But the answer is basically overwhelmingly, yeah. Can I play this later? I want to ask Monty more questions. We also found something that's a little bit unusual. Monty managed to stir up empathy. See if he can relate to this. I said calm down. He didn't calm down. But then when I, tell, when I tell my sister to calm, when she tells me to calm down, I get really angry. So therefore I stopped. A year six student was able to articulate that clearly like that. That's not me tweaking it. So it promotes reflection. I can live with that. And on that note, any questions?